Talk she. Recorded live. Hey everybody, welcome to the Idiot Engine. Today we're going to be talking about creating characters. Um, I'm Ted Seco, and I've been doing comics and mini comics for the past 15 years. Uh, You can see my stuff at tedseco.com. There's links on the right side if you go to the page. Uh, I've got a YouTube page with some uh, short animations. I've got the uh, Talk Shoe page uh, that's got uh, past episodes of the Idiot Engine. And uh, I've got a link to Web Comics Nation where I've got some uh, of my work, uh, my comics actually posted as Web Comics. So it's totally free. You can check it all out. And that's me. And uh, today is kind of a special occasion on the Idiot Engine. All of you listeners out there are um, kind of uh, set for a treat. <laughs> this is uh, actually the first time I've ever had a woman on the show. So uh, this is kind of a, a pretty unique uh, situation. But uh, I've got um, Mary Bellamy. Is she's a self-publisher, and I'm going to let her introduce herself, but uh, she's co-hosting today. So, uh, well, Mary, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Hi, my name is Mary Bellamy. Um, I've been doing comics for about nine years now. I started out with uh, Radio Comics, uh, Antarctic Press, did some work for Slave Labor in their little anthology, and then I decided to go off on my own, publishing my books, uh, Ah Heck and Faux Facts. You can find my stuff online at marybellamy.com, or if you all are on DeviantArt, it's Rainbow Ice, R-A-I-N-B-W-I-C-E, and um, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm glad that uh, that you agreed to be on, Mary. Um, before we get uh, on the topic of creating characters, uh, I thought I'd spend a little bit of time just, uh, you know, uh, maybe talking to you a little bit about your experience, because uh, I've... I've known you. I met you this past year, and uh, we had uh, we had an opportunity to talk on various occasions. Um, but I actually never asked you, and you probably get this asked a lot uh, by by fans and stuff. But um, what made you like get into this road warrior, crazy, incredibly difficult, struggling type of career that we know as self publishing? Well, I can tell you that I didn't actually start out wanting to do comics. I really had no interest in it. I was more of an animator. I loved Disney movies. I loved 80s cartoons, you know, Thundercats, My Little Pony, um, all that kind of, like, varied stuff. And I started to get into anime. But back when I was a kid, nobody called it anime, like the Little Bits, Maya the Bee, the Grimm's Fairy Tales. Stuff like that. And then finally, Sci-Fi Saturday came out with their anime line. And I knew that I just, I liked the way that the stories were not the same kind of censored, safe American stuff. Um, I I started out out of college, but was having a hard time finding work. And a friend of mine said, you know, I work at Radio Comics. I I do a a story for their uh, furlough anthology. It's, you know, funny animals or anime style stuff too. And so... I decided, well, I'm going to start, you know, maybe going into comics as a way to try to go sideways and get into animation because in the end, all I really want to do is tell stories. So yeah, yeah, either yeah, either in animation or or on the printed page, it's it's all storytelling. Yeah, so I basically I started out and in the beginning it was kind of rough. I got rejected from some places, but you know, I'm kind of glad because when we all first start out, we look at our work and we think it's good and then Five years later, we're like, oh, my God, why did I draw that? That's so sure. so bad, you know? Yeah, it's a natural feeling, yeah. So I basically, um, my very first company that accepted me was Shanda Fantasy Arts, and I did a couple of short stories, like four-page stories for their, uh, they had little anthology books. And so I had, like, one where a character... Basically, she's she's a little con artist. She wanted to get a, a one of those super powered uh, water guns, and the whole thing was, oh, I have no money. How do I get money? So her and her cat are walking around like, oh, can you give money to charity? And so the people are giving her money, and then we realize at the end, 
when she said charity, she didn't mean charity like donations. She meant her cat. Oh. Her cat's name was Charity. Oh, so she ended money. up getting the gun. Oh. She ended up getting the gun by conning people out of money. Well, so that funny. was one of my first. That was one of my first little short jokes, you know. Yeah. yeah and yeah. after then, I, they asked me to do some inking work for some of their other books, and I did some. And then I decided I kind of wanted to move on to a little bit larger company. So I went over to Radio Comics, and they had their uh, anthology at the time where American Manga, it was called uh, Manga File. And it was like the only place at the time where the average person could submit stories and have them published. I think there was Mangazine by Antarctic Press, but it was like the rival company. Mm-hmm. So I had my story, Faux Facts. And okay. Faux, Faux Facts is basically a series of little stories um, based on true things but expanded, hence Faux Facts. Oh, like fake facts. Oh. Yeah, fake facts. You oh, know, okay. cer- certain things in the story are true, things that have happened to me or have experienced or certain things. But then I blow it up and explode it and make it funnier. Oh, okay. That's funny. It's a neat name, too, Full Facts. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So then after that, I kind of moved over to Antarctic Press, and they had a couple of anthologies with their Gold Digger line and Ninja yeah. High School. Yeah. So I did some pinups for them, and... Eventually, I got asked to uh, do a little short story for uh, Slave Labor. It was, um, what is it? It had an anthology. It was like zombies. Okay. And I'd never been asked to do a zombie story before, so I kind of put my own spin on it. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember that one. <laughs> that, was a, that really showcased, I think, your, um, you, have a, uh, you have an interesting sense of humor. I mean, that, oh, yeah. especially that story because it's it's a zombie story, but um, there's sort of a it, it's sort of a dark you know they talk about like dark humor like a dark comedy or something there's sort of a dark side to it but it, it's funny it, yeah it's really it really is pretty neat uh, now where where where's that uh, published in uh, slave labor graphics okay yeah I remember looking at that uh... yeah it's called Fat Chunk Volume Two sla- uh, yeah. Zombies. Yeah, yeah, that really was uh it was a neat twist on on kind of the, the Yeah, I, I didn't want to go the, I didn't want to go the obvious route of oh, I'm going to yeah. eat brains and ah, yeah, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. It was, so it was like just something fairy different. Tale. Yeah, yeah. Like, it was sort of like a little fairy tale that had sort of this dark side side Well, you know like of, grit, like Grimm's fairy tales were not happy stories. Yeah, they were kind of dark true. and sinister. Yeah. Yeah, they're really creepy things. I mean, uh, Hansel and Gretel was that a Gr- that wasn't Grimm's was it? Yes, yeah. And, oh, that was. Yeah. yeah, that was creepy. I mean, when you think oh yeah, about well, it. the whole point was to make peasants that were having horrible, miserable lives feel better about their stuff by seeing characters suffer worse than them. Yeah, I mean, there's there's like people eating people and like getting you know just getting like that witch got stuck in that furnace or something and oh, you got to read the Goose Girl if you want twisted. The, what is that? The Goose Girl. That's a Grimm's fairy tale. Oh yeah, it's. All sorts of crazy. Really? Yeah, you go, look it up on Google, guys. It'll, okay. It's kind of crazy. It, it's the goose? The, the goose, goose girl. Huh. Yeah. It's, we actually heard that one in our eighth grade class, and everyone was like, oh, my God. Well, well, of course, we you, had a more you, liberal teacher who had no fear of telling us strange stories. In eighth grade? That's that's actually pretty young. Can you give, uh, can you give me, like, a little teaser? idea of what it's Okay, about. well, basically, you have two people that look very similar. One person yeah. is jilted, wants to take over that other person's life, and she does, except um, there's a prince who knows something's going on because he finds her dead horse, that she, dead magical talking horse. Its head's, like, stapled to the wall, and it tells her what happened. It tells the guy what happened. And Whoa. they trick the girl into, you know, basically admitting it, and then... She's like, well, how would you punish someone who did something like this? And then she says something very horrible, and then they do it to her. Jeez. Yeah, I'm it still, was kind of intense. I'm still stuck on uh, the dead magical horse head. Yeah, I know. I was like, what in the world? <laughs> yeah, he, she decapitates the horse or something, just nails it to the wall. Oh. But either way, I kind of like that kind of dark thing contrasted to the humor of it. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, you kind of got to take the darkness in your life and make fun of it. Otherwise, you're going to wallow. I think that's true. I think it's it's easy to, uh, well, I mean, there's all different ways to cope with stuff. And, you know, humor is a, a good way to do it. 
I, I think it you know keeps us going. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, earlier when you were getting into this whole comic book thing that you actually spent time just inking. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So you didn't. So did you? Do you like just doing like specific things? Like do you like well, just it, inking it's, or? Well, you know, personally for me, I I just like coming up with the stories and the penciling the most part. Okay. I think that's where I get the most enjoyment. But it is fun to ink someone else's work because mm-hmm. you don't have that self-doubt. Like when you draw it yourself, you're like, I could have drawn this arm so much better. I could have done this oh, so much better. And then you start to nitpick the work. Yeah. Whereas if somebody else has given you the pencils, mm-hmm. you just have to fit, make give it the volume of inking, give it the shadowing or the motion lines or whatever. Huh, and I kind of had a... I kind of had a bolder inking style, so it really made a lot of people's work pop out more than it usually would. Yeah, so you weren't just, uh, there was a movie, I think it was, was it called? Yes, Inkers? yes, I've heard. Inkers are just tracers, no. Yes, yes, so you were actually, yeah, you gave, you, you gave something extra to it. You, you added yeah, I, tr- to the I tried piece. to make it thicker and pop more. Yeah. Well, I think that's, that's real interesting because, um, you know, it's, I get work in animation sometimes, and in animation, uh, you know, it's it's assembly line work. You know, everybody has a certain function. Everybody does a certain piece. And then at the end of the, the assembly line, you have a completed cartoon or whatever. And it really does, it, it is kind of fun in a way because there there is a little bit of, le- there's less pressure. You know, like if, if I just say I do cleanup. Right. And I don't have to concentrate on the drawing. All I have to do, which is, you know, it's no no easy feat, but I have to, you know, really... Well, yeah, because they've out. already set out the staging for you. They've already set out the action. All you mm-hmm. just have to do is just make it more defined. have to make it more defined and, and clarify everything. So in a way, in the, in that kind of assembly line situation, even the guys who are writing, they don't have to worry about, Oh, how should I stage this? All they have, you know, they're not responsible for everything. So it is kind of nice in a way um, to work on a on a project, you know, to work on part of a project because everybody can just focus on their one thing, and then in the end you get this, you know, you get. I will say though that the only negative part is when you get pencils that aren't very tight, and you really have have to to guess. So you were in that situation. Where I, had I've had a issues. few issues that were given to me, and that the, uh, the penciler had to really rush or something. There was emergencies yeah. or whatever, and we understand. It's just sure. when you're like, okay, is this a leg, or is this an arm? Yeah. You know, yeah. or is that supposed to be a tree? Do I need to make a tree and add leaves, or or what? Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, you so sometimes it... you don't want people to think, well, this is your fault. You know, because you're at the end, you're kind of, it, it falls on the inker to be the, the finished person. Yeah. You know, unless yeah. you're doing toning or shading or something, but the inks mm-hmm. are really what make it finished. Have you ever done, uh, gotten work? Because I really um, admire your color, you know, the work, because I've seen some of your new, I, I, I mean, I picked up both of your books, the uh, Fofax and, and the Ah Heck, and I saw what you're doing on the next issues and how you've been kind of upping everything. But your color sense is really strong, uh, in my opinion. I was wondering, have you ever just done strictly just coloring of comics? Uh, no, you know, I really haven't had an opportunity. There's, It's like kind of a very small group of people. And mm-hmm. I think right now I've seen their idea of coloring for comics, it's a lot more painted style or it's like gradient style. And mine's kind of like a hybrid sort of anime cell shaded but not... It's like a harder edge coloring style. And so I can be a little more rough and loose with it, mm-hmm. whereas if I had to do it for an actual company, I'd have to sit there with the pen tool and be very, very, very precise. Yeah, I guess it depends on what they're looking for. I know what you mean. It, it seems like in comics, uh, a lot of people are critical about the, the new comics coloring. Everything has, like, these highlights. Like, everything is shiny. So yeah, it's, it's really like, overdone. Yeah. yeah, not even, you know, you could have, like, flat, you know, kind of flat colors in nature. I mean, just clothes, and they're shiny, or people's skin. I mean, everybody looks like they're made out of like, rubber steel or plastic. Or glass. Yeah, and they're just kind of glistening in the sun. Um, but your your the color really is strong, and the the new stuff that you were showing me the other day is just well, thank wow. You. Yeah, I 
I I've like, been working. Uh, I've been working more on you know popping the characters forward so that the backgrounds are still a part of it, but that the character stands out a lot more easily. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, it, on it, on the latest one, um, like on the first issue of Fofax, I started. Um, you know, like when you you can do layers of shading, and in Photoshop you can select isolate selections of colors. Yeah. And what I used to do is I used to hue saturate and then change it per color. But okay. but lately I just said, you know, it looks it's okay, but then it doesn't give you the same impact as if you have a solid color. Which yeah. is why in a heck I pick a certain color for shading depending on the section of the story. So like when uh Angel is in her first version or the first part of Hell, everything's a bluish green. Everything. Like all the shading is bluish green. Oh, that's interesting. And then when she goes to like the the heck section of hell, yeah. um everything's like this light soft pink because it's a joke on everything being cute and happy. But it 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 goes it goes across the board like over everything in that that area. In that in that arc and then in the next oh. version of Fofax, I decided, okay, what if all the characters in the foreground have warm shading and everything in the background has cooler shading? Hmm. To give kind of atmospheric perspective, it, yeah. it's just all of it's just a learning thing for me. I figure well, if each book can improve, it, yeah. Well, and then also, I mean, what you're saying, what sounds really fascinating to me is you've got this, um, you've got this like overall like a you know you you know there's color there there's story arcs and everything, but you've got like this color arc, you've got like this color um, design to your whole book. It's not yeah. just kind of like localized color, okay, I, this looks good, this looks good. There's kind of a there's a meaning behind it kind of. Yeah. Like, I try I try to make everything I do have a reason behind it. I I sense that in in the story um aspect of your work. Like when I was when I read your stuff, you know, I might not know everything. I might, you know, I, I don't have like X ray vision where I can look right in your brain or anything. But I sense that there's layers. Like it's not just, you know, superficial just what you see on the page like there's stuff behind it yeah and i think that that really does i don't know that that makes the whole reading experience a little bit more satisfying I well that goes into the important. character creation that we were talking about yeah yeah no it's um well let, yeah you know what let's get to that let's okay. uh, we we we'll start going in there um no I, I just i'll throw it out to you since since you're the uh the co-host for today mm-hmm. how do you create characters mary well, you know, characters are interesting because there's the whole idea of an iconic uh, archetype. You know, you have the strong character, the weak character, the the character that has a problem with everything. But, you know, it, it's kind of like it gets a little stale after a while. It's very, you, know? yeah, it, it, you see it a lot. Because there, there's always, like, the perfect hero. Yeah. And now lately it's always the anti-hero who has dark, yeah. sinister motives behind his tragic life of, Whatever it is, that you know, cliche, yeah. you know, like mm-hmm. Batman's now he's all more, he's even more brooding. Well, at least yeah. the latest, the last issue I've read, but I'm not very in on the superhero thing. No offense, but you know, it's like, it's like, oh, you know, that's okay. But like to make it more real, I kind of borrow things from my life. None of my characters are specifically a person. Like you couldn't say Rosemary is, from Faux Facts is any particular person in my life. Mm-hmm. But I kind of take little pieces of myself and I yep. build on them. Like I kind of okay. have a like a sarcastic humor sometimes. Sure. And people tell me I should be a comedian, but I don't really have the desire to be up on stage. So, hey, Rosemary can do what I really don't want to do. Oh, so she's your comedian aspect. Right. You know, she can be okay. the, the smart, sarcastic one whose humor is a little biting and she doesn't mean to be, you know, controlling, but it's only because she cares. Mm-hmm. You know, like Retta from the last story in Fofax, she, she's a workaholic. All she does is focus on her work. Mm-hmm. Because, like, when I was a kid, school was all I could focus. That was what I could control in my life. So that's all that I did was school, school, school. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of wanted that show that, the personality is that some people can make anything negative. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the whole thing is she gets offered to be taken to a trip to the beach and you've yeah. been working your butt off all week. 
Yeah. And in her mind, she blows it up into this crazy thing with killer starfish. Everything's awful. Oh, my God. And flips out before she can even go to the beach to experience it. Because, you know, so, when I was younger, I kind of had that same kind of mentality, so I wouldn't do stuff. And so yeah, Retta yeah. is just that way of acting it out in a story. But that's one aspect. But you you said that you'll when you create a character, you kind of, it's sort of like a combination of things. So that aspect of her is is like from your but then she's got other aspects of her and where do you get those other aspects of who she is well you know it's like people you want to be you know because in oh, the okay. end she'll end up being very successful her okay. her all her flaws do end up turning into something yeah yeah you know and like mm-hmm. Su- sunny you know is super happy it's like the person everyone expects people to be She's like that person who can always, you know, turn a bad situation positive, even if it kind of gets uh, saccharine sweet. Uh, yeah, the, the the true optimist. Because I've known a few people like that, and they drive you up the wall. Well, no, are you, is, there, is there any aspect of you that's like that, or are you just taking from people? No, that you that's know? more of what people want me to be. And and that's what, like, you, you've known people that were sort of like Yes, that, and that I've that known, you, like, okay. several people that are just like that. And you can only take, like, limited doses of people like that because it's so artificial. Uh-huh. And I'm more of a real oh. person. I'm kind of blunt and in your face. It's just how I am. Mm-hmm. Love me or hate me, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, you're just, you're who you are. You're right. I mean, you make no excuses. You know, and some... Re- yeah, no, I was going to say that seems really interesting that... um by doing that, you really do make the characters uh, like the characters more real because they are real. You know, they're based on like real people. I mean, I mean, I, I put sim- I put symbols in there too. Like in the first issue of Fofax in the finished volume that you bought, uh, Rosemary ends up having to do battle with a killer hairball. Mm-hmm. Well, here's a little secret, and I'll trust you guys not to tell anyone, but. Hairball was a pet name for a psychotic ex my mom had. Mm. So in a sense, Rosemary's kind of like me, yep. and he's kind of like a hairball. So oh, I... she takes her aggressions out on a killer hairball. Yeah, yeah. But you know well, what I mean? That... It's kind it's... of a joke. It's funny. It's it's funny, but also is it sort of, um, like for me, when I make my comics, they're personal in, in kind of a similar way, and it's just a good way for me to kind of, you get your frustration out. Exactly, exactly. You get your frustrations out. Because, you, can, you, can you know, you're not your advocating hair. attacking anyone. I mean, who's going to fight a killer hairball? Exactly. And, I'm, you know, I'm not saying, you know, the world's going to end and we're all going to be fighting zombies. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's the <laughs> 2012, way... people. 2012. We're all going to die. Well, <laughs> just kidding. I... I'm just teasing. Are we going to die like that movie died? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's like knowing and all the kids get abducted by aliens. Who knows? I haven't seen that one. It was actually a lot better story-wise than 2012, but 2012 had better effects. Yeah, I heard the You know, limousines flying through falling buildings, that's that's crazy. But it looks real. Oh, it was awesome. Okay, wow. As long as you didn't mind there wasn't a plot, but, you know. (laughs) Sometimes plots are, you know. Overrated. Overrated, totally. Um, Okay, so so that's one way that you... um, you, when you create characters, uh, the personalities is you actually draw from like aspect, you know, you and people that you know, and you you put that even in the the storylines themselves, like experiences. Like about, like, like another oh, character I could touch on is uh, Heck uh, in Ah Heck. It's the second character, the second leader in in Hell that Angel ends up encountering. She's this super cute little girl. She's got big bouncy blonde hair and bows and sugary sweet, except she's perhaps the most powerful person in hell, except that nobody can take her seriously because of how she looks like, because everyone thinks she's a little kid. And so they won't respect her because she she just looks like she's she's like... Right, because, you know, in my life, I look about 10 years younger than I am, 10, 15, depending on who you talk to. And, And you really notice how people will condescend to you and oh. you get treated differently, and it, it really ticks you off, you know. You're like, hey, you know, you can't cut in front of me in line. Oh, well, you're a little girl, you know. And I'm like, no, I'm dude, I'm almost 30. No. What are you talking about? Well, well but, you know, some, I'm sure some people, they wish they people thought they were younger. 
Well, you know, it's, in some ways it's good, but in other ways it, it's really frustrating. So I kind of wanted to stick that on the character because yeah. while, it, you know, if you're in hell, you're obviously there for a reason. Sure. You know, even if you're ruling it, you have to have some kind of flaw and some kind of punishment. Yeah. And so, yeah, and uh, if I remember correctly, I mean, that's not who she, she doesn't look like. I mean, that's just like her. She's cursed, right, to, to look like Right. There, there's a scene where we see a glimpse of what she actually used to look like. She's like a warrior or something. Yes. Like a warrior lady. Yes. Oh, okay. So then, yeah, so you can put that life experience into that character because, yeah, you actually do look very young for your age. I mean, um, so you, you've kind of had experiences where people have kind of slighted you or... Um, yeah, they try to pull stuff over on you. Yeah. But, you know, I just, I just instead of dwelling on it, just turn around and stick it into a character. Yeah, make, yeah, put it in the story. I mean, it, that's what makes the story so interesting is, and you know what, what else I think really makes it interesting is you have a lot of different life experiences, all these different people that you know, all these different aspects, you can put them all in your story, and, and it, I think that's what really makes the story kind of rich and interesting. Well, thank um, you. Yeah, well, and, and the fact that it's all, every you know, a lot of it is based on real real life, on your life, it, it's kind of fascinating, because would you say, like, if a person reads your work, do you think they get a sense of who you are? I think if they take it more at a deeper level, that they might see what I'm talking about. Because if you, if you look at Angel's plight, she really didn't do anything so horrible to deserve what happens to, to her. Yeah, she tried to uh, take that thing, right? Was yeah, that she it? tries to steal the purse. It, it's something, yeah. it, it's bad, but, you know, in the scheme of things, it, what is it compared to, like, a serial killer or something? Okay, yeah. And it's kind of like, in my life, mm-hmm. you know, you get piled on for the smallest mistake. And you've mm-hmm. got to overcome this mountain of stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's just like the reaction to the the stimulus is so much greater. And I just wanted to show somebody who has to av- overcome because in my life I've had to overcome a lot of stuff. I mean, what is a story without some tr- some conflict, some struggle, some reason to be trying to get out of something? But yeah, you definitely need I mean, if you're going to make a story you know, you have to. There has to be a point to it. There has to be like a, you know, a challenge, uh, like you said, something to overcome. The, the other thing I was going to say too was, I think a lot of people can identify with this, this what you're talking about. Like a lot of people have been in situations where you know, they've gotten dumped on. You know, where life has really thrown them for a curve and stuff, and. So that's probably one of the um, one of the things that people can kind of share with you, and and probably would enjoy about reading that. They could really identify with that feeling, you know, of yeah. of really having to overcome this. So, yeah, that's another that's another thing that I think is important when you're making a story, especially you know, like what we do. We're we're self publishing. We're trying to make. We're trying to entertain. We're trying to I don't know if you would say enlighten, but we're trying to entertain and. Um, but yeah, you know that that's why I wanted to. It's like I would. I was trying to shop my stuff around, but the problem with many companies, and and I can understand where they're coming from. They want to guarantee sales and such, and that's completely right. valid. But yeah. at the same time, they kind of force you into this cookie cutter. Like I had a critique about Ah Heck. Oh yeah, you should add a boy character to it. Make the girl just a side character. Oh, the boy should be some tragic victim. Oh, I know. Why don't we make it a school classroom of some kind? And why don't we oh. do this and why don't we do that? And I just, yeah. I was like, eh, thanks for the advice, but I think I'll stick to my my own stuff, you know. Yeah, I mean, well, it, it, in this case, I mean, obviously it depends on the situation. You know, if you're working for a company. Right, no, yeah. I, as, yeah, as like hired talent, then obviously you would, you know, it, it would be a collaboration. But it seems like if you're self-publishing, you know, there's so many disadvantages of self-publishing, you know, trying to make the money and all the hassle and headache. W- one of the few advantages of self-publishing is you could do it your way. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I mean, what, that's the whole point. Well, you know? see, it, it's one of those weird paradoxical things where if you try to go in the front door and you pitch and they make you bland it down, nobody really remembers you. Whereas if you go off on your own and you do your own crazy kind of humor, somebody yeah. might eventually come along and say, hey, you know, I really like this. I mean... 
there's a short on Nickelodeon. I think it's called Making Fiends. Okay. And this girl was, I guess, doing web cartoons or something, and Nickelodeon thought, oh, my gosh, that's so awesome, and they gave her a cartoon. Oh, but they they like what they she found did. her online. They found her online thing that she was just doing for herself, and then she got yeah. picked up as a show. Oh, so I figure, yeah. you know, at least if anything, whether I get discovered or not, at least yeah. I can put out stories that people like to read. Yeah. And and you like to make. They, yeah, because it's like, what's worse than having someone say, "Well, I really hate your style. Why don't you make all the characters look like generic Saturday morning cartoons?" And that'll totally sell. And so, okay, maybe they hire you, but now you're drawing something that isn't you. It doesn't have your yeah. voice, and you feel really empty inside. Yeah. No, you know, as opposed uh, to going on it on your own and someone saying, oh, well, this style really isn't so bad. You yeah. know, even if other people want to label it, I still like it, so I like the book. And then eventually maybe come in the back door and someone republishes a, a series of your stuff or something. Well, that that is why I think a lot of companies are looking – to independent publishers and artists for things. I mean, you know, look at like the Ninja Turtle thing. You know, that that just took off and, you know, these two guys, they just made it. And, and, and it was kind that, of a joke, too. Yeah, it was just a joke. It was just for fun, you know, and and, and they loved it. I mean, and that, I, I've heard, I know, like, um, you know, since all the superhero movies have been making money for these, you know, big, ginormous studios, you know, people are buying a lot of properties. You know, they're kind of looking, they're sort of harvesting, I think, from uh, the self-publishers, you know, from, right. from the indie guys. And so, see, I, I, try to, I try to market something that's completely different because my, girl, my shows are, prim, my series are primarily aimed at girls, but I write for everybody, you know. Yeah. And I kind of got tired of, like, you know, I have no hate on princesses and stuff. But like one can one can of, only sit yeah. through so many princess stories. So and so is a princess, and she's waiting for her husband. Oh, we'll switch Our it up. Is, she goes yeah. to look for him. Well, yeah. it's like nobody's a princess. I'm sorry, and you can only take so many reimaginations of, of fairy tales. Like the second they do Goose Girl as like a fairy tale on, as a Disney movie, that'll be the end of the world. You know. <laughs> Yeah, the reality will split. Because there's a princess there, right? But it's incredibly violent and yeah. gruesome. But, um, you well, know. I mean, the, the reading your work, I never got the sense that it was aimed at uh, women or, or right. girls. I just well, didn't get that sense. You know, it, it's, it seemed well, like... Well, my, my whole thing was I got sick of seeing stories that were like, the protagonist is always a boy. And there's always some girl... Or something happens to a girl, or he wants a girl, and that spawns the whole story. Yeah. You know, there's there's always this secondary female character. Oh, there's this snotty girl with attitude, or oh, That's it's good. it's Laura Croft oh. with big boobs, and hey, no problem with boobs, I don't care, but yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's like, can we have something a little deeper? Because yeah, I, I, I do have a few action shows, action series I want to do down the pike, but yeah. you know. Well, I think that's. Uh, let me ask you. This is kind of, kind of, gonna, gonna go back to the the creating characters. Right. Um, when you when when you make a project, like when you're starting a project, does the character come first, and then you create the project around it, or do you think of the story, and then uh, as you flesh out the story, the create the character. Is okay. Well, certain things created. are. Sometimes it's one way, and sometimes it's the other way. Yeah. Like with my whole Zori Lita line, I came up with like a design. And I kind of like the whole uh, girl fighting team thing. And I didn't really have a story. I had kind of shell personalities. They didn't really have a backstory until just recently. I've I've come up with a whole reason for them to exist and oh. all their intricate personalities and why they do what they do and like I said, that'll be the, an, another book coming soon. And, and same with Project Lamb was a story I did for a manga file, and I'm reimagining it in uh -huh. a better format. But though um, Zori Lita was basically, like you were saying, the drawing came first, and then the oh, story. Right. Oh, but okay. Project Lamb is more like the idea behind Project Lamb was I had a stupid teacher. Every day he saw me would say, Mary had a little lamb. 
And he would do the new stream rhyme a billion times. Wow. So I said, okay. I was like, okay, fine. If I have to hear about a little lamb, let's make it sci-fi epic, okay? Hmm. So I made a sci-fi story around the whole thing of lamb. Oh, which was based on this teacher that used to recite that. And I'm sure if he still saw me, he would say the same stupid nursery rhyme. Well, you know, he might want a cut of any profits you get. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. <laughs> no. I'm sure my stuff doesn't quite fit that that market where he's at. So. Oh. Wow. But, you well, know, I, I had to make something positive out of it. That came an idea and the characters came after. Yeah, and you like, had this, you know. And that, that protagonist, too, also ha- is basically dragged into something way larger than herself than she ever even, it's like, it's totally not even her fault. Oh, okay. She gets just dragged into this militaristic program, sci-fi oh, epic yeah. thing. Wow. And it's not even her fault. So it's kind of like what's happening, you know, with me, mm-hmm. you know, like, Situation. long story short, is like the city tend to steal my neighborhood. I have nothing to do with it, but I'm being dragged into it. Well, yeah, yeah, it's involving you because these bigger kind of forces are, are you know. Getting... Making decisions that affect my life. Exactly. So huh. that that's kind of her, you know. Yeah. And faux facts is basically stories, and then I made the characters fit into the stories. Oh, okay. They didn't well, exist at first. It was just kind of like, oh, what if I had a story about killer starfish? Okay, well, how do I make that work? Oh, okay, yeah. Sunny invites Retta to it, you know, and then build it up from there. But, yeah, you build up from story to character. At that On, on that level, because they were just little, yeah. originally started as little blurbs because it was an anthology book, and so oh. you maybe had uh, anywhere from one to ten pages. And that was published where? Radio Comics. Radio it's Radio Comics. Comics with an X dot com. Okay, I remember. Yeah, are, are they? Do they? Um, uh, well, they got really the socked hard by the Diamond. The Diamond has new cutoffs. Yeah, I heard about and that. And so, uh, they're. I think they're trying to reformat all their books because. They just can't meet these new sales quotas that they're saying. Yeah. And then they they might be doing print on demand, oh, or okay. coming out a lot less frequently and turning all their floppy books into uh, actual no- graphic novels. Yeah, just compiling them all because that way they can. Right. Uh, that way they could do it like once or twice a year, but they could still publish. Yeah. Oh, I see. So so, so they're they're online, so people can find the stuff. Yeah, radiocomics dot com with an X. Okay. And you can find some of my old stuff there, but. Buy the new stuff; it's better. Yeah, and then you can the people can buy the new stuff just directly from you. Yeah, you, you know, uh, marybellamy. dot com slash sales page dot html. I've got the first two books, some buttons, and my new plush toy line. And I gotta tell you, those look good. I, I uh, you showed me the, and and I know it took a long time for you to get. Oh yeah, I had to right. be very meticulous and demanding. But you know, okay. if you're gonna pay for something, it better be what you want. Yeah, I follow you on you're on Facebook as well as you're on Twitter. Yeah. And uh yeah, it's it's like this, it was a sort of long journey. Yeah, it was I was starting to get kind of angry cuz it's like, look, can't you just make the wings double-sided? What? It's like well, she's not Cheeto orange. She's like a butterscotch color. It is something though cuz I saw the original uh you know the the first prototypes that they had worked out that they sent you. Yeah, there Whoa. was nothing. It was they nothing. Looked, they just looked really off. I was and like, then, what the heck is this? It's like a Chinese knockoff. Well, and then when, when you showed me the actual finished uh, uh, pieces that you got back, you you have three of them. Yeah. They look, they look great. I mean, the the designs the, are great. The colors are still a little off because they're the prototypes. They have to dye the fur. Oh, okay. But, but that's because I'm color. Remember, like, everything I do has to be color-wise. Nice. Yeah, no, so I had to match I, up some Pantones, and they'll be better at the finished. But I mean, they look they look great to me, and I I just thought uh, I'm not sure the the company that you use. It, I know it was sounds like it was it was kind of a a, a, a hassle in a way working with them, but the the products uh, the the plushies physically they're great. I mean, they feel very you know very yeah. Like, Solid. Well, I hope to have them at, at San Diego Comic Con. Okay. I should have them at my booth. I'm going to actually be in the small press section at N4, same place I was last year. Look for the giant black and white Zori Lita banner. Yeah, and then look for the the warrior princess lady behind the. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. I am the rat slayer. I have to do a comic about that someday. Yeah, that was quite an ex- I tell you, you know, people, if they follow you on Twitter or, you know, Facebook, you, you know, <laughs> your life literally really is like these comic books that, that you're talking about. Well, yeah, because, you know, most of these people, if rats are flying at their face, they'd run screaming and not punch it in the face as it's flying at you, you know. Yeah, you use a <laughs> shovel, you know. Oh, yeah. You got Chase a lot after of it's like, you ain't going to get me. You get a lot of points from a pro wrestling fan like me. Definitely not going to get on a chair and scream like a girl. Though no, I've known a lot know. of guys that do, and that's kind of funny. Well, I mean, you know, I I think uh, having having balls, so to speak, is not a gender thing. <laughs> you got to have you aggress- You got to be aggressive enough because if you don't go stand up for what you want, you're never going to get it. You get you get walked that's, over. Because that's what I you'll can get, tell you, get, like. For my yeah, experience, I started out very, very shy, yeah. very quiet, and I was very timid. And yeah. after a while, it's like, this isn't getting me anywhere. Just go yeah. out there, say what it is you want, and do whatever you can get. You Do whatever you can do to get where you want to go. You're well, not guaranteed to get there, but at least you know you're doing the best you can. And it sounds like there was that point where you... You know, like everybody hits that fork in the road. And so you hit that point where you could either probably just get mowed over or just start fighting back. Well, I you think that's I, mean? I think that's my, my, my brush with death with the operation that I had, and I almost died. I just said, you yeah. know what, if I'm almost going to die, screw it. I'm going to do everything I can. I'm not going to sit here and let people run my life for me. Yeah. Wow. I think that really... Because that really spurred me to put out my first two books. Because here I am moping that, oh, a certain large anime anime manga company, you know, passed me over for a certain contest where I was actually a winner, but it's last second I get booted out. Yeah, well, yeah. I said, you know what? And I got I kept getting rejected. I'm like, okay, fine. I get it. You don't want me. I'm not one of your crew. You know, when you okay. see worse things getting published, fine. I'll publish myself. And print okay. on demand really really gives people a way to help themselves because not everyone can fork out a couple thousand dollars for one Talk book run, None of my you know, I and, and I know I don't have an entire garage to stick them out in the books that I hope might sell. Yeah. I mean, at, at this point I've sold like, I don't know, 260 books just at a few convention, like two years at a convention with yeah. no advertising. Well, I mean, that's really good. And you don't really do, a lot of shows. No, uh, I mean, San Diego was my San Diego Comic Con is my only show. I mean, this is going to be my second year having my mm-hmm. actual own table. Yeah, and you actually did pretty good because I know last. Yeah, year, I'm the only Comic-Con, one who broke even. Comic Con was really tough for a lot of people, me included. You know, I mean, it was just a really rough. People don't really, you know, a, a lot of the bigger companies had a hard time too. Um, but I guess you. I, I didn't know you at that point, so I didn't even I didn't even see you at the show. But you were pretty active, you said. In terms oh yeah, of you know you gotta you gotta. I know some people don't like it, but you kind of have to shout out at least a tagline. Say like, "Hey, comics for girls that are not about princesses and makeup." And they're like, "What?" And then they come over, and then they start looking at your stuff, and then you tell them what it's about. Yeah. Which is why I'm telling you, you need to say, "Naked Baby Saves the Universe," and be like, "What?" And that at least get them to come over to your table. Either that or they throw me out of the building. Oh, good <laughs> job. I mean, I've seen some pretty bizarre comics over there, you know. Yeah, well, that's true. It's, it's you got to have a gimmick. There's got to be something like, I don't know if you saw Bob the Angry Flower. No. Dresses just... up like a flower every year. Oh, wow. We've got this little cardboard cutout he sticks over his face. It's, it's hokey, but it gets people to come over. Have you ever thought about... Um... You know, do you do you are you gonna get like any kind of props or wear any? Kind well, of someday I'd like or... to have a costume made of Angel, but you know, it's all those things that I can't sew. I'm all thumbs. Oh, okay, yeah. Which is why I hired someone to make my dolls because, um, yeah, <laughs> I don't think I could do it. Well, you know, like I said, those look, look really good, and I gotta just tell people out there that one with the black fur. Yeah, and the, the, Yeah, and the hair over the one eye. Because he's an that's... emo. Yeah, that one looks neat. And, and I'm one, hoping I'm hoping at Comic Con I will have like I've made little mini comics to explain who the characters are. That's a great idea. That's a little great full, marketing tool and really great idea, yeah. Yeah, little full color uh postcards that come with it, like thanks for adopting Devorak, here's here's who he is. And then it ties into my Zori Lita line. 
kind of telling you who some of those characters are, kind of opening the door for that series, which after I get all heck volume two yep. and done, then I'll probably move on to Zori Lita or Project Lamb. Oh, okay. Well, let me ask you, like, the, the character stuff, you know, they're, when you create a character, I, I'm sure it's not conscious, but do you, because these characters that you're talking about, they're very kind of marketable. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, you're making the stuffed animals of the, the, the um, you know, these uh, you know, the three stuffed animals you made. Um, do you think about those qualities of a character when you're designing it, or does that just come after? Like after you make the story and the characters, then you think, well, how can I market this? Or well, do you build well, it in like, when you're designing? Two of them, I had the idea, but I'm not going to say what the how I came against them without you reading the comic first. Oh, okay. But I really like Dvorak. Really, he's the black one with the bat wings. He's really, really devoted to Bunny because they grew up together, okay. and so he's very emotional when it comes to her and very protective of her. Yeah. So I really kind of wanted to bring that out in his design, like with the hair kind of covering his eye, because it kind of hides about who he is a little bit. It makes him a little more mysterious. Yeah. 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 You know, whereas Jeroboa, he's just very fun and lighthearted. That's why he's got the big black eyes and, okay. you know, he's very light designed. Nothing too, nothing too, you know, aggressive or anything. Honey was really the more of a, um, she was more of a design that kind of came after. She didn't exist before, but I felt I had too many male sidekicks and that needed a female. And oh, so okay. I I sort of partnered her, partnered her up with uh, Samia, who is, uh, one of the girls with, you know, white hair, and she's like the, the group's comedian. She's kind of like the one that lightens the mood because it's kind of a little bit of a serious but not too serious series. And so I was like, well, I've already got a bat wing and an angel wing. What else is there? And I thought, well, you know what? How about a fairy? Because a long time ago I had just drawn a picture of her with fairy wings. Oh, okay. I mean, totally non-canon. It, it doesn't happen anywhere in the series. But, you know, I like to design and... Part of my character creation, it's not always even about a character. It's like I really like to make clothes. Oh, like if okay. you if you go to my um, DeviantArt page, it's rainbwice.deviantart.com, um, you'll see my big main in- image is Dance Lotus Revival Bride. Mm-hmm. And her whole existence was like I had designed this costume. And I had designed this crazy elaborate anime hair style that couldn't exist. It couldn't exist anywhere in the universe, even if you had, like, 10 gallons of, you know, hairspray. Oh, it's just, but, like, a really elaborate, like, a... Oh, yeah, character. she's got braids and tons of hair that God knows how much her head would hurt if she ever pulled it down, you know. <laughs> but, you know, it's a design. Yeah, and yeah. I kind of came up with her role after, and in the prose Zori Lita, the, the written story, she's another kind of background character. And I kind of oh, pull okay. her out later and give her her own story. But you but, designed her, her, her look and... And, uh, and then I kind of gave her a story her. after. Oh, okay. So she yeah, didn't... I mean, she wasn't canon at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, what uh, what would you say inspired your visual character design sense? Could you say that or, or did it just come well, to you? Well, you or? know, the first thing I always hear is, oh, it's anime. But you know what? I really grew up on 80s girly stuff. Like what? Like My Little Pony, Lady Lovely Locks, uh, Dream, dream Catchers, I'm... Popples, Care Bears, I know Care uh, Bears. Rainbow Bright. I know, I know that the, what the, the hair, what did you say that, that other, the second one, or the, some kind of hair thing, or what was Lady Lovely Locks. It's yeah, about, it's so, Lovely it's, Locks. So cornball. It's about these princesses, right? And they have these magical rodents, and they have long tails full of, like, rainbow-colored hair because no one's ever heard of hair dye. And these these animals would uh, hide in the hair of the princesses so they could have rainbow-colored streaks in their hair. This is a cartoon? Yes. It's an old Deke cartoon. I think it was about 87, 88. There was a doll line and a Hallmark greeting card line. And and it was just rainbow colors. It was very anime-esque before anybody even knew what anime was. Yeah. You know, it was animated by Deke Animation. Yeah, you did. Yeah, and most of my stuff really came, I mean, even a lot of my color stuff came from, like, 
American stuff. Like, uh, you know, the popples are like rainbows, walking rainbows that fly around your screen. What the, and the My Little Pony you mentioned, that... Uh, the original I, one, not the new one. Ugh. Oh, I, yeah, I, I've never seen either one. <laughs> but oh, well, you're lines, lucky not to see the new one because it's all vector-based and ugly. But the storylines of all these these cartoons you're talking about are very kind of traditional, just basic stories? Or? Well, you know, it's funny... Um, my Little Pony actually started out very occultish. Like, the very first episode, the ponies get abducted by this giant ram villain who's very much like an embodiment of Satan. Whoa. And they're all locked up in a in a dungeon with, like, chains and stuff. Really? It's very, like, weird. Like, the unicorns can wink in and out of our universe, but when they wink to a one place, they get stuck with this demon guy. Wow. And, like, the stories are just so different. Like, from anything today, it would totally get censored to death if it was on today. Oh. You'd never see any of this stuff. That's why I liked it, but then anime had a different kind of story that was even one step above it. Yeah, you know, a little bit more, a little bit more, uh, I guess, put darker. Or, it could be uh, darker. It could be more intense. Characters could die. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, they died in American cartoons, but not in the same way. You wouldn't see it on the screen. And, a lot Not, of times, and I don't mean blasting holes through them. I mean, like, if somebody dies, they're just like, oh, he died. Yeah. Well, even G.I. Joe, people, I don't remember if he's the soldiers. You know, Joes didn't really die, did they? Or, uh, no, no, but it was, it was. you could actually, at least in the 80s, you could sh- point a gun at someone and shoot it. Yeah. And yeah, and now it. there's actually, like, rules from the, I don't know, Ways and Means Committee or something. I don't know what it's called, but the board, the, the censor board will say, a character can't even touch a character. Like, you'll see a character raise their arm, yeah. and then it'll be a cut, and the other kid's like, oh, my God, you hit me. And you oh, can't even man. show the character smacking the character. Like, you know, if you watch Rainbow Bright, like, uh, was it Murky kicks the crap out of Lurky all the time. She's, she's they, smacking his no, sidekick all the time. Are these are the, are the, like little, uh, are they little elves or something? Or? Oh, he, um, I think Murky is just like some cranky little guy, and they live on a mountain, and Lurky's like this big fuzzball that's kind of stupid, and he hates Rainbow Bright because she's so bright and colorful, and it makes him annoyed. So, you know. You know that's it, just, uh, so trippy to me. Yeah, you know, I, it's, I, but I, the I, 80s were all about stories that had a moral to them. Okay. All of them. There there were certain clones. Like, there were certain leaders, like Rainbow Bright. And then oh. there'd be, like, um, shoot. There were some, like, dream catchers or something that kind of mimicked it. They all had oh, characters. It's like, with the characters that are designed, they all based on a rainbow color. Which oh, is okay. why I got tired of Americans saying, oh, well, the rainbow color was based on Power Rangers. So I'm like, no, go back to Rainbow Bright, you know. You've got Shy Violet and... and patio green and all their colors line up with what their names are hmm. you know so, so so that that really was kind of that's like where i really to... came up with my stuff is from that and anime yeah. after that was just kind of like i got infatuated with sailor moon because you have characters flying around naked transforming and zapping stuff that you wouldn't see in the american stuff but then yeah you know, I kind of went back. I made my own little anime fighting characters, magical girls, and then I'm like, oh, this is kind of cheesy. I'm going to go back to my own stuff. And I yeah. went back to more of a indie, archy, American hybrid. I can totally see that. It, like in your work, it really is It it is kind of archy-esque, you know, or archy-esque, but also, you know, like I said, I've never, I never watched My Little Pony or Rainbow Bride or anything, but when I think about your work, and the kind of the way, the way things are designed, you know, the like the costumes and the hair and everything, it kind of makes me. It really does make me think about like sort of the a a little bit of an influence from the eighties. You know, yeah, because I, I, I mean, if you go back now. and you look at like Jim and that, they all had cowlicks. It, cowlick was not. <laughs> well, it no. wasn't unique to like Princess Toadstool from Mario. Okay. You okay, know, yeah, it yeah. wasn't unique to that Japanese style. You yeah, look at yeah. Demona from Gargoyles, and she's got that whole anime cell shaded thing, but it's an American show. Yeah, you know, hair's, yeah. hair's pulled into certain clumps. It's got a pointy end. It can cover the eyes. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It, well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I grew up watching uh, the American stuff and the Japanese stuff, but the Japanese stuff was 
was the stuff, the dub stuff, you know, like Gigantic right. was the, right. dubbed in English. Um, but I, I love the Hanna-Barbera stuff. I love the... Uh, well, see, there, there's the thing that uh, I thought was stuff. funny is everyone's like, oh, Hanna Barbera is awesome. And I'm like, but in a way, um, anime is like Hanna Barbera because anime you're using is. anime yeah. because it's it's like limited animation, kind of oh, like Hanna Barbera was limited. That's true. This you know, because if you look at Hanna Barbera, maybe the face is moving and the whole body's just a frozen frame. Yeah. And they're just animating over the mouth or their own, you know. And anime is kind of like, oh, here's a scene where his mouth is flapping for like 10 minutes. And oh, it's the yeah, same yeah. kind of basic, when you put it composition-wise, maybe the action's different. You know, the yeah. takes are obviously different. No anime character's eyeballs popping out like that rat fink character or anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, you know, that's why I kind of do a, a middle-of-the-road kind of emoting with my characters. I've kind of dropped the whole sweat drop thing and, and the little anger lines. But Okay. You know, moving back to more Western, I guess. I mean, I never actually was trying to be anything. I'm kind of of the mode where if something works for your character, use it. Who cares where it came from? Well, yeah, you're not you're not like um, uh, anime person, or you're just your own person. You have your own style that's that's obviously developed through your experience watching, you know, the the '80s cartoons you know, anime, whatever mangas you've read or comic books you've read, you know, your life experience. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, I still feel that way about my work too. Is It's just, it's what I do. I mean, you know, maybe some of it looks a little bit manga-esque and then other parts of it look kind of like, oh, I can sort of see, you know, uh, Mike Mignoli or Frank Miller kind of stuff style in there. But I'm not consciously, do. I'm not doing any of that consciously. I'm just making something. Right, I think looks right, good. and and I think that's the the hard part as a creator when you're trying to go to a company and before even reading your book they go, oh my god, this must be anime, and I'm like, no, it really isn't. Look at the panel structure; it's very western. Yeah. Look at the action; it's very western, and you instantly get shot down. Oh, you can't do anything else. I can't talk to you. I won't even give you an art test, and you're kind of like wow, you know, if you just read the story, you say you want witty, spry stories that tell things in a different perspective. And that's certainly what I think that I do. Yeah. And I got rejected simply because I didn't draw a simple American generic kind of cartoon Kim Possible face. I mean, you, Kim Possible yeah, is great, but why do I want to copy want. it? Yeah, you, they wanted to see... Um, like you said, the generic stuff, but you were doing your own thing. But maybe you're right. Like you said, this this woman that made Making Fiends, maybe that is, I mean, and that's what I'm doing. That's what I think all of us self-publishers are doing. We're doing our story. Yeah, and I, and I think that the Internet has really helped a lot of people because I could say that like 10 years ago, you wouldn't see web comics. People would be like, what's a web comic? What does that even mean, you know? People wouldn't be going to YouTube like you're saying that that guy the last the unicorn or something. Oh yeah, you know Jim he's Mahat. he's yeah. making his own webtoons because you know I'm sure he couldn't go to Cartoon Network and and say here you know do my story. You know, so he's going off on his own. You know, trying to build a following. And let them discover him. You know, let, right. Let you know, you still have to go them. out there and say, hey, dude, check out my website. You know, marybellamy.com. But you know what I mean. You have to put it out there. Otherwise, yeah. no one's going to find it. I mean, I have times where people promote my site and my website hits go up like a hundred, you know, a hundred page views in a night. Oh. And yeah. other days, you're like, oh, you're lucky to get five, ten hits. Yeah. You know, but it, it's all like. You got to go out there to message boards, have your you know website in your URL, all that in stuff in your signature on message boards. Yeah. You know, uh, sites like DeviantArt.com, while there is a lot of junk, you have to wade through really bad traces of like fan art and stuff. There are some real gems, you know, and it can really inspire you to do stuff. You know, you got to be careful that you don't assimilate someone else's ideas accidentally or. Maybe not so accidentally, but you know, it it, well, it gets you out there, and at least you can network and talk to people and say, "Hey, you know, I have this book." Internet yeah. sales, I will say, are very hard. It is hard to convince someone to pick up and buy your book when they can't pick it up and thumb through it. Yeah. But there are people who will be willing to give it a chance. So you got to have the option open. 
And if they know your stuff, if they see more of your work, like I'm assuming on DeviantArt, you've got a lot lot of work on there, a lot of other samples. Right, that you know, it, it doesn't always lead to sales, but then someone could see someone who saw someone who saw that, and then, you know. Well, and then they could go, you know, maybe they hear about you from a friend of a friend of a friend, but yeah. then they can go instantly to a DeviantArt site and see all of your work. Because I know I oh, was surprised at, at Comic-Con. Yeah. I'm sitting there, and she's like, oh, my God, you're Rainbow Ice. And I'm like... Yeah, she's like, I recognize your style anywhere. I'm like, wow, that's cool. Yeah. You know, and, and what's really good is when you're sitting at a table and someone gives you repeat business. Oh. They're like, I saw you last year. I've got to have your next book. And it, and it just makes you feel so happy because you're like, wow, somebody's actually reading my books, you know. Well, they like your work and, you know, they're Because you send, you send stuff out into the ether and people buy it and you're like, I wonder what they think. Do they think yeah. this sucks or do they like it? Nobody's saying anything. Oh, crud, you know, because there's, there's just the silence. Is... I really do think, yeah, a lot of people, I mean, it's, it is hard to tell how many, you know, how you're being, your work is being received because people just don't, they they will not comment, you know, on normally. Right? Yeah, and then, of, you, then you also have the converse of, like, people are like, well, you should post all your pages on the Internet. And I'm like, well, the thing is, sure, that could get you more views, yeah. However, there's this prevailing, if I can get it for free, why would I pay for it? You know, yeah. hence the whole piracy movement online. Why would I buy a CD if I could just download it? Well, definitely the Internet, the one thing is, like you said, you know, se- selling on the Internet, it, it's really kind of difficult. But the thing with the Internet is it's a great advertising tool. You know, like... Right, right. You just really got to be intense and, about it. Like... There's this girl I know. I'll just plug her because she's cool. Uh, Miss Monster. I think it's MissMonster.com. Okay. She she does like billions of different products. I mean, she's got these tentacle keychains and these postcards of this Krampus guy. And, and I gave her the link to my doll guy. And she, she's made a little dapper doll. And she just like, the reason she's so successful is because she's out there every single day. Hey guys, I just painted another Cthulhu picture. I just, yeah. I do this, I do that. And it's like, the more you're on top of it, the more you're going to get out there. So she puts out a lot of original oh, art she's got on tons the internet. And tons of stuff. But that original art helps her sell her merchandise. Right. She she oh, does man. woodcut paintings. Like she'll actually cut out freeform characters and paint them. Oh. So it's like if I wish I could be as productive as her, but you know, real life well, here. But different. you know, everybody's different. Everybody's got you know their own lives and their own things they got to take care of. But I think yeah, I mean, totally. It, it's a great tool for advertising. Right, uh, but maybe, then, yeah, yeah, her stuff is so more weird. like just more like what's in demand, and like I said, my stuff is more character oriented. So I'm trying to drag, dra- you know, not drag, well, maybe, but draw you into my universes and get you interested in my characters more than, you know, just drawing Jack Sparrow or something on an art card, which I'm not opposed to. Yeah. But well, I kind of want to draw you into my world so that you would want to know more about Zori or yeah. uh, Project Lamb or Ahek or Fofax, you know. Yeah. Well, and uh, you also do commissions, right? On right, uh, right. You know, if you said I want Bob the alien cow killer or something, and you give me, you know, instructions and pay me, and I'll draw your dude and send it back to you. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, you have a very strong, unique style. I think that's, uh, um, you know, it, it really is a very identifiable. So I can totally see somebody if they see your work. They, they, there's no doubt who it is. Yeah, I, and I have five people say it, said that, you know, I can really see your face in these designs. Wow. Like, someone's like, oh, my God, Zori's face looks like your face, like some of the expressions. Yeah. And, you know, I don't actually really look in a mirror. I know everyone's like, oh, you should look in a mirror, but I kind of, it's kind of a weird thing. You kind of, you feel the emotion in your own face, and then you draw it. We all draw it. So, yeah, I, I, so I think yeah. that's how they can see who I am, because I behave in certain ways. Yeah. I can see a, I can see kind of a resemblance, you know. Yeah. Well, well it's not it's, always super strong and everything, but people have said, yeah, yeah, the eyes look a lot like your eyes. I mean, obviously not know, gigantic, but you know. I I am one of those people that literally just I'll, I'll pull out a mirror. So if anybody gets any of my mini comics, I mean, you've I I uh, you've read my mini comics. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And you see me in in my work. Yes. Yes. 
like, yeah, I mean, literally, sometimes I'll just I'll use my expressions. I'll just throw it in there. But um, I think that's the thing that strengthens uh, what we do is it's very personal, and it is us. You know, it, they are reflections of who we are. You know, and and I think that's where a lot of uh, some some series fail is like they go, oh, um, let me do my knockoff of like a, a Mega Man, or let me let me do my knockoff of something, and it really loses heart because there's nothing in it yeah. that's you. It's just like a second, third generation copy of something. I mean, do I want to read a comic book about Sonic the Hedgehog if I could just go over and go buy Sonic the Hedgehog? Yeah, exactly. You know. It's like I'd rather have the genuine article, somebody being truthful, even if it kind of offends people. Like I know a lot of the, like, like I've had people like turn their nose up at my stuff because I've had like some supernatural stuff in it, and I'm like, my whole life I was kind of exposed to the supernatural, like people who've done kind of witchcraft and stuff. And I mean, okay. I'm not advocating it. I'm not yeah. saying it's good. I'm not saying it's bad. Yeah. But it affected my life, so I write well, about you, it. Yeah, yeah, because you you met people that were sort of into like the occult and those kind of things. Yeah, and you know, so it's it's going to affect you. I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying it's bad. But that's why I put elements of magic and things like that into my stories. Like that's why Fofax has uh, Tiger Lily, because uh, I've met people. Tiger Lily was basically the angry rich girl. She doesn't know why she's angry, so she starts to pick on you. Oh. Like, when I was in school, I'm not going to say her name. Yeah, Let's just well, say uh, Bobby. Okay. Uh, she decided that she hated me, okay. and that was it. And every day, my clothes were ugly because I was poorer than the rest of the kids. Oh, she, yeah, she picked on you. And made oh, it was, her. like, merciless. And, like, she would get everybody to turn on me. Yeah. And so that kind of, like, those kind of people... I put into Tiger Lily, and then I added the element of the magic to it because, I mean, th- these people are just so full of hate that they have to do anything to try to destroy you. Wow. Now, now, like, Tiger Lily and them are able to diffuse the whole thing because yeah. if you're always working and good, good will help you. Yeah, yeah. But that's kind of the aspect that I put into it because so desperate to do stuff, they'll turn to anything to, to do whatever they're – goal is well and then i think those, those characters that you that you create through these your you know, your past experiences and you know your your personal experiences that really does make the character stronger and it makes it easier i think for obviously you to write them because they're real you know like right. you you know these people i mean it's that that does make things stronger it's, even though people don't know I, I would say even though people don't understand why, they know that there's a genuine, there was, there's a, an authenticity to your work. You know, they, right. they sense that it's sincere. Even right. if they don't know, you know, they don't have to know all of, you know, the, the back story, all the history behind, you know, this character. When they read it, they'll just get the sense of it being very sincere just because it is. You know, that's something that people, I think, very clearly they get that. Yeah. If it's not written, they'll they'll get that sense. Okay, they see that it's authentic. They see it's real. They see it's sincere, and and that comes across. And it it does, like you said, come across much better than a third, fourth, fifth, sixth generation knockoff of some you know typical thing. You yeah. Know? So I think that is a great that's a great tip. Like for people trying to create a character, is write what you know. Write what you know. You know, put something of you in it. Put something of somebody that you met in it. But don't don't make it like a total autobiographical, because then it'll be really obvious. Like, oh, this person hates their mother. You yeah, know. I mean, I mean, some don't people, be too heavy-handed people, with it. Some but people do use that. it as some an influence. Just, yeah, I mean, some people when they they they'll use a character, maybe they just use themselves. Maybe they can just do an autobiographical piece. Right, right. If that was your intent, then that's fine. But when it starts to be like, well, last Thursday my mom said I couldn't go shopping, and so I got angry and set the cat on fire or something, you know. Wow. It, well, character. Yeah, you know. Yeah. I have a lot of pyros in my neighborhood, so, you know. <laughs> but, but yeah, if I think uh, that that is strong, too. If you just, you know, don't, you know, put a little bit of aspect. I like what you said earlier about, 
you know, these characters, it's not just, oh, this is that girl that picked on me, or this is me. You know, they're aspects of real Of you, and then it goes off in another direction. It doesn't have to be that particular person. Yeah, then it can be something else. Like like for me, like maybe my character could be a burned-out ex-pro wrestler who happens to have, you know, my you know, maybe my attitude towards uh, family or something. But, you know, it's a combination. And that's actually very fun as a creator is to don't just copy yourself or copy one person, but we are in a position of creator. We're making this whole world. We're making these people so we can make these people as fascinating and as interesting as, as we want. And the more fascinating and interesting these characters are to us, I think the easier it will be to write stories. Right. With these characters. Right. You know? you know, like I said, it inspired me once I started going back to Dory Lita and really putting in who I wanted them to be. I mean, I started writing again. I think I'm at like mm-hmm. twenty thousand words. So, yeah. so you know, uh, yeah. and then it inspired me to go back to Project Lamb because I'd had it sitting. You know, it it started as like a twenty four page thing in, in manga file, but it was really the wrong format for the story. And so it was rushed, and I was telling things instead of letting the characters do things. And at the time, my art just was not – I mean, we can all say that our old art, you know, is bad, and it just didn't lend itself. So, I, you know, I'm up in the air as to whether uh, Project Lamb should be drawn or more prose. Oh, okay. But, you know, it's like if as long as – see, I like to paint with – I like to draw things, you know, have details, but then I can also paint with words. It can be very descriptive. So, so you mean like writing just novels, just like right. stories and novels, yeah. Because I, I love descriptive writing because, you know, as artists, or if you're like a real artist, you can sit there and say, you know, articulately describe something like it was a vivid violet yellow and it sh- the sheen was like a oil slick across a rainy sidewalk or something, yeah. you know, and you, you really put the images in the person's head without actually having to go and draw, you know, the person and what they look like. And definitely there's there's things that you can write that you can't draw and I think Right. You know, your your mind, like the reader's mind, is probably the best canvas. I mean, if you yeah, can get let, a person, let them put the pictures together. I mean yeah, I don't think that J. K. Rowling had to draw a picture of Harry Potter for us to all imagine what he looked like. Yeah, and then maybe that's better because the the, the person will imagine their ideal version of it. You know Right their version of it um you know mary i um i've actually got to take care of something oh okay (laughs) so um i'm going to act this is this is it's a it's been a great it's been a whirlwind and i hope i hope maybe if you have time we could do this again yeah i wouldn't mind on on the engine again but um i'm going to wrap this up so okay you want me to uh, shout out my websites again? Yeah, yeah. Shout out your website. Uh, any other uh, uh, announcements about like you know uh, things that are coming up for you? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Just give yourself a shout out. Okay. Well, um, like I said, I'm going to be at San Diego Comic Con 2010. I'm going to be in the small press uh, N4. It's straight across from row 1700, like right at the A gate. Um, I'm going to have Va- uh, ha- Ahek. Faux Facts 1 and the new Volume 2 coming out and the new Plush cool. Line. Yay. Um, my website is marybellamy.com. And if you want to check me out on uh, Deviant Art, it's Rainbow Ice, R A I N B W I C E dot Deviant dot com. And if you all want to check out my books, that'd be awesome. You know, if there's any commissions you want, give me a, give me an email. Okay. Okay, well, thanks, Mary. And uh, man, I tell you, uh, like I said, that that one uh, with the black fur with the bat wings. Oh yeah, Dvorak. Yeah, Dvorak really is 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 amazing. Design. Yeah, him and Honey are selling the best. Poor Jeroboa isn't getting love though, but you know, who knows? Actually, it'll it sh- you know catch up. Just a matter of time. Okay, um, well, everybody, that's it. Uh, thanks for listening, and uh, Mary, thanks for being on. You were the first uh, woman ever to be on the Idiot Engine. I hope. Uh, hey, no problem. Hope it was okay. That was fun. You know, I might have to put up some more uh, colorful curtains and maybe some flowers next time. Oh, please! I like <laughs> but, spike pillows and cra- and crazy military stuff. I'm not on the girly. 
Wow, very cool. Okay, well, thanks everybody, and uh, I, uh, you know, uh, uh, glad Goodbye. you guys listened. And yeah, see you, Murray, and I'll talk to everybody else later. Okay. Have a good one. Bye.